Oh, I'm dreaming. How many of you know if you're singing an old song, you got to throw a lot of sauce on it? You know what I'm saying? Of a wild Christmas. Good morning, Joy Church. How are you doing? How many of you guys are excited about Christmas? Come on. How many of you are over 40, but you still get presents? Hey, I love it. My mom still gives me a budget. I'm, I'm actually over 30. And she's like, Jake, what you get? You know, here's your budget for Christmas. And I'm like, sweet, mom, here's what I want. It's sad, but I'm not going to give it up because I still love Christmas because we know that Christmas is about presents. That's what it's about. That's what it, no, I'm just kidding. Christmas is about Jesus, but Jesus wants you to have presents because he loves you. And uh, if you ever have those people who are like, Christmas is about Jesus. And so those people, you know, Jesus wants to have fun too. Come on. All right, here we go. Good to see you guys today. So excited to be together. How many of you are over the crippling depression uh, of the uh, organ ducks loss yesterday? Um, I'm so thankful that maybe though, though uh, we, we uh, lose on Saturday, we always win on Sunday because we get to be together. Yeah, get to have a great day at church. And I really believe today that, that what God wants to do is encourage some people. I know for some people that that Christmas season can also be a time, for some it's really great, it's really awesome. For other people it's not so great because it reminds you of hard things with family, so on and so forth. But here's, my, here's what I believe the Holy Spirit wants to do today is encourage you in this season, lift up your faith. God wants you to leave with, with more joy than you walked in here today. And not just because you got coffee and donuts and all that, but because you encountered the presence of God and God spoke a word to you. So welcome everybody. God's gonna put some joy in your spirit. I wanna welcome Joy Church UO over on campus over there. Hope you guys are doing great. Hope you have some great coffee and donuts over there. And we're excited to be together. Well, we're jumping in today to a, a short mini series. It's kind of like a, a Hallmark mini series, but better. Um, short mini series called Unlikely. Somebody say unlikely. 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 And we're just talking about uh, the highly unlikely story of Christmas. The highly unlikely story of Christmas. Uh, Christmas is an incredibly unlikely story. How many of you ever had something happen to you in your life that was very unlikely and it happened, but you tell people that it happened and they're like, that, no, that didn't happen. Anybody? I remember one time uh, I was at downtown Disney. We were at Disneyland. Somehow my parents had gotten, dragged us down to Disneyland and they were there and I was a teenager, so I didn't want to be there, but I was there. And I was walking through downtown Disney, which is kind of this marketplace area outside of, the, of Disneyland. Anybody ever been to downtown Disney? And I'm walking along and I kind of got my head down and all of a sudden this woman comes in and almost bumps into me in this beautiful kind of French Canadian accent, says, oh, excuse me. And I looked up and it's Celine Dion. And so, of course, I said, hello, Celine, how are you? No. <laughs> I was just kind of like, oh. And she's like, oh, excuse me, pardon me. And she's chasing this kid. And it was Celine Dion, no joke. And her whole retinue's there, her entourage and all this kind of stuff. And I go back and I'm like, guess what happened to me, family? I, I, Celine Dion almost ran into me. They're like, no. Like, seriously, it was Celine Dion. I looked up her picture. I saw her husband was there. I mean, it was Rennie, you know, this guy, that her husband. It was Celine Dion, and she almost crashed into me. Incredibly unlikely, but true. You ever had something happen to you like that? Highly unlikely. And that's exactly how the Christmas story is. The Christmas story is incredibly unlikely. Now, we have to get rid of all the gloss and all the, the Hallmark cards and the, 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 you know, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas and kind of put ourselves back into this moment 2,000 years ago uh, that this whole setup, it was very unlikely and very different, actually very traumatic. And, you know, the, the reality is that the cr Christmas is heaven's D-Day. It's the moment when God is invading this planet, when God becomes a man and invades this planet to bring goodness and peace and righteousness to, to come back into our story. It's his invasion to reclaim what's been lost. And I want you to think about what you would do if you were God and you were going to invade the world and begin to reclaim what was lost in the fall. And you were going to try to set the story right and, and do this whole thing. If it was me, I'm coming in guns blazing, right? I mean, if I'm God, heaven forbid, right? If I'm God, uh, I'm, I'm going to be like, okay, how many angels can we, can we get together? We're going to show up in Rome. I'm coming down. I'm going to have a white tuxedo on. I'm going to be wearing a diamond grill. Uh, we're going to hit the ground. And it's just going to be like, Caesar, this is what's up. I'm here. I'm Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Right? Like how many of you would do it a little different? But this is what God does. He does it a completely unlikely way. Shows up 
in the form of a baby. Now, we're all familiar with the Christmas story, but think about this. This is God coming to this planet to reclaim what has been lost, this invasion. And he doesn't come in guns blazing. He doesn't come in like, oh, with all the angels. He comes in and it's just a baby. Incredibly unlikely. Why is it unlikely? Why, is it, why did he do it this way? Well, it's because the world has gone upside down in the fall and sin and brokenness and abuse and power and all this kind of stuff. And God sent his son Jesus in humility in weakness as a baby because he's turning things right side up. Jesus came into this world of greed and power and violence and lust and a world where people are demanding their own way, forcing their own way, and God does it exactly opposite. Our God, the God that we serve, he delights to clothe his power in weakness. It's paradoxical, but it's, it's actually more powerful. He's turning things right side up. Our God clothes his glory in the ordinary. And how many ordinary people are glad that we have an extraordinary God that, it, that clothes extraordinary things in ordinary people? And so what I want to talk about over the next couple of weeks is this reality that God uses unlikely people in unlikely places, in unlikely ways to achieve unlikely purposes. And I believe God's going to speak to you and encourage your faith, even through this Christmas season, to begin to believe that God could do something with your life, that God could do something with you, that you're not too old, you're not over the hill, that you're not too young and, and immature, that you're not too uh, rich or too poor, you're not too whatever, that maybe you are the most unlikely person, but God delights to use unlikely people in unlikely places in unlikely ways to achieve unlikely purposes. And that's what Christmas really teaches us. I want to talk, talk to you over the next two weeks. And the next week's service is actually going to come on video, and we'll let you guys know that. But we're not meeting here next week. So if you come on Sunday, you can see a movie, but we won't be here uh, for church. But we will be online, so you can say hi online. Um, but over the next two weeks, I want to talk about two uh, groups of people, or an individual today and then a group of people next week, that were incredibly unlikely people that God chose to use. And this morning, I want to tell you the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, I want you to try to do your best to get rid of all the imagery and, again, all the Hallmark Christmas cards and everything that you think you know about Mary. And I want you to try to see her as, a, as an individual, as about a 12 to 14 or 12 to 15-year-old girl, most scholars believe, that God chose to use in the most incredible and likely way to do one of the most unlikely but incredible things ever done, which was to carry and give birth to the Son of God. So who is Mary? What's her, her backstory? We're going to pick up the story in Luke chapter 1. Verse 26, Luke chapter one, verse 26. And again, I want you to try to put yourself in this place. There is no Christmas. Bing Crosby never sang a Christmas song, right? There's been no Christmas movies. Rudolph's nose didn't even light up yet at this point in time. These are just real people in a real situation, okay? Luke chapter one, verse 26 says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, this is Mary's cousin, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel, this angel, he appeared to her and said, greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. That's how angels talk. They say, they say things like greetings, right? And it says in verse 29, confused and disturbed. Confused and disturbed. Listen, to, see the humanity here. An angel shows up, hey, right? What are you, you're gonna be confused and disturbed. It says, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her. For you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. And the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you in the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. And it says in verse 39, a few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. This is Zechariah and Elizabeth, her cousin. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child, who's, this is going to be John the Baptist, this baby inside of Elizabeth, leaped within her. Probably didn't feel good. 
Just, I haven't been pregnant, but I, I did uh, play a pregnant woman on TV once. So, no, I'm just kidding. Um, that was a bad joke, but you can still laugh. Help me out here. Thank you, Shannon. Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, uh, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. And then we're going to skip down to verse 56, which says, Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then went back to her own home. Okay, so we just read a lot of scriptures. What does it mean? Let's talk about Mary. Let's talk about her backstory. Let's talk about this young woman and this incredible thing that is going on in her life. I just want to say, first of all, this is incredibly unlikely. First of all, an angel shows up and is like, boo, I'm here. Greetings, right? And it says she's confused and disturbed. This doesn't happen all the time. You know, I think sometimes we read the Bible and we think, oh, everybody's just seeing angels all the time. They're just popping up. Hey, we're going to do some cool stuff. That's not, we just get the highlights, right? This is kind of like Sports Center where you get the top 10. But people aren't just seeing angels all the time. Mary's confused and disturbed because this is an unlikely event. This is something that's going on that's very outside of the ordinary. <clears throat> and I want you to think about her situation. So here's an angel and he says, hey, you're going to get pregnant with God's baby. I want you to imagine her t telling her mom, you know, after the bump starts to show, no, mom, it's God's baby. <laughs> Come on. Think about this, right? No, seriously, everybody. I wonder how many people have used the Immaculate Conception defense. <laughs> just historically, right? I could just see a lot of young, no, mom, seriously, it was God's baby. Yeah, right, yeah, right. I mean, it did, just because this is 2,000 years ago, people didn't believe this. They, they understood how the birds and the bees worked, right? I was homeschooled, so I only got like a little book that was so vague that I just feel weird when I think about honey now. I don't know exactly how it works. I have three kids. I don't know what happened, right? But Mary, I mean, I want you to think about this. She says, Mom, this is God's baby. Now just put yourself in the situation. Do you, why is she confused and disturbed? Because it's a confusing and disturbing thing. What's well, Christmas? It's weird. But God is using an unlikely thing. He's using this. And then Mary, think about the ridicule that she's facing. And you got to understand, Nazareth is this tiny, podunk little town. It's literally so small, it doesn't really even show up in the archaeological record. Nazareth, if you can imagine, is like the kind of place that you drive in, there's a gas station, and a weird guy, you know, that runs the store. He's also the mayor and the mailman, and he owns, you know, he, the whole town, and you just get out as fast as you can. Nazareth had between 30 and 300 people, uh, total in this whole village. So it's a small town. So you know how that works in a small town. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody knows everybody's business. And everybody thinks your business is their business, right? And so here's Mary. Hey, everybody, I'm pregnant and it's God's baby. Sure, Mary. She faced a lot of, of ridicule. So much, you know, even the situation was so unlikely that her betrothed husband, Joseph, who she's going to marry, they're basically engaged. It's kind of a a super serious engagement is kind of to get the idea of how this works. Joseph's going to put Mary away quietly. He's going to divorce her, but the, the Lord actually has to show up. An angel has to come to Joseph and say, Joseph, this is my thing. This is okay. Like God has to literally come and speak directly to Joseph and, and make it clear. This is a rough situation. This is a rough situation. <clears throat> but here's the thing. God saw something in this young woman, again, probably between maybe 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. He sees something in her that makes him choose her. He sees some strength, some faith, some determination, something that's going to allow her to be the vessel of God's bringing deliverance into the world, delivering Jesus and, and, and being the mother of Jesus. I want to ask you today, as you think about Mary and her story, even in this Christmas season, do you have the faith just enough to believe that God could see something in you that you don't see in you. I mean, see, as we sit here right now, all of us, we, we, we right now are probably underestimating the impact that we can have in this planet, on this planet. The impact that we can have as followers of Jesus. What could your life be used to bring into this world? Well, it's too unlikely. I'm too unlikely. I'm too, I'm in the wrong place, wrong time, wrong stage of life. I'm too poor. I'm too this. I'm too that. I'm too busy. Whatever it is, could you just believe? Could you just suspend disbelief? Could you just say, God, what could you do with my 
Yes, what could you do with my life? Do you see something inside of me that maybe I don't even see? So here's Mary, she's confused and disturbed, but God says, I see something in you. You're the one I've chosen to use. You see, God is looking for people who will just say, God, even though I'm unlikely, I believe you could use me. God is looking for people to demonstrate his glory through. Could that be you? Could that be me? Absolutely. God is looking for people to demonstrate his glory through. So here's the thing about the way that God works. God isn't looking for people who are already strong and successful and look like they have it all together uh, to go and carry forth his will. You know, you got to think about God goes to the outside edge of the known world, the Roman Empire. He goes to, to Galilee, to this tiny little podunk village, Nazareth, and picks a young, basically a girl, to, to go through this incredibly unlikely thing to, to carry Jesus. He doesn't go to the kings. He doesn't go to the politicians. He doesn't go to the religious leaders. He doesn't go to the likely. He goes to the unlikely. Here's why. Because when your success comes from your strength and how great you are and how awesome you are, you get the glory. But when your success comes even through your weakness because God is strong in your life, then God gets the glory. So here's the thing. If you are an unlikely person, you're actually more likely that God will use you to do great things. Come on, somebody. That was good. You could tweet that out. If, if you are the kind of person that's like, man, God's going to use me. He can use me. I'm full of faith. I sing with lots of vibrato. You're probably unlikely. But if you're like, man, I just don't know. I don't know if God could use me. I'm kind of just like, God, I don't know. And you're kind of doing this thing here and you have to pee really bad. You know, you're just, you know, you're nervous and you're not sure. And you're like, could God use me? Yes, God can use you. Because when God uses you in your weakness, then he gets the glory. See, a lot of people are like, man, Jake, it's easy for you because you're an extrovert. You just love getting up in front of people. I hate it. I crawl and I go home after church and I get in bed and I have to recoup because I'm an introvert. I have to pee really bad right now because I'm nervous. I don't like getting in front of people. I like it more now because I have to do it every single week. But let me just tell you right now, I'm not the most likely person. God has to use me in my weakness so he can be strong. God wants to use you. Come on, somebody. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about this. He's talking about a thorn in the flesh, something that's a torment to him. He says, I beg the Lord to take it away. In verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 12, he says, Each time he said, my grace is all you need. And this is God. My power works best in your weakness. Paul says, so now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. How many of you want the power of Christ to work through you? How many unlikely people are like, you know what? okay, I want the power of God to work through me because I'm pretty weak. I don't have it all together. I'm probably not qualified, but I believe that God can do something with my life. Come on. Do you believe it? Paul says, that's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, the hardships, the persecutions, the troubles, the organ ducts, losses. I added that in there. That I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul's not saying that his weakness makes him strong. He's saying that his weakness allows God to get glory through his success. Come on. When your success comes from your strength, you get the glory. But when it comes through your weakness, because of God's power, he gets the glory. So this morning, I want to leave you with three thoughts about achieving, achieving, not unchieving, (laughs) unchieving. That's a new word. It's Shakespearean to make up new words on the fly. Um, Three thoughts about achieving unlikely purpose, believing that God can use you, and three thoughts from the life of Mary and what we see in this passage. Number one, you have to respond in faith. Respond in faith. I love this in verse 38 that we read in Luke 1. Mary says to this news, at which she's confused and disturbed, she says, I am the Lord's servant. Hey, God's coming to you. I want you to start a joy group. No, 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 no. I'm too unlikely. I'm too unlikely. Here's what you need to say. I am. And the Lord's servant. In our dream team, we have a, a little covenant. How many of you finished next track and you're part of the dream team? Raise your hand, wave at me. Come on. Yes, you guys are awesome. And in our, in our little statement, we say, my answer is yes. When I'm asked to serve, when I'm asked to lay my life down, when I'm asked to step forward, I, I'm coming lo- preloaded to the table with a yes. Isn't that a, good, isn't that a good way to be? When God comes and calls you to serve, when God comes and calls you to give, when he comes and he calls you to do something that is unlikely, even when you are unqualified, your answer should be yes. Mary says, I am the Lord's servant. That's the right answer. That's the response of faith. May everything you've said about, have said about me come true. Her emotional state 
is given to us. She's confused and disturbed. I think a lot of times we think that the people that do great things with God are the ones that are confident and you know, all that, but that's not true. She's confused and disturbed. That's her emotional state. That's her mental state. She's not excited about serving God in this way. Hey, Mary, guess what? Got a really nice job for you. Everybody's going to call you a, you know what, forever. Even Jesus, when he's in his 30s, he's being called an illegitimate child, right? He's being called illegitimate, which is a nice way of saying something not nice, People, they, they thought, you know, Mary, yeah, sure, God's baby. They never got it. You realize Jesus goes to Nazareth. He can do no mighty miracles there. People didn't believe because they're like, no, no, Mary just, she just, uh, you know, had a side hustle going and that's where Jesus comes from. People never, the, the, the town never connected. This was Mary's challenge that she was given, but she says, I am the Lord's servant. How many of you are glad that she, was, that she took on that ridicule? How many of you that are saved by the blood of Jesus, saved because Jesus came to this planet and died on the cross for us, are glad that a, that a young woman was willing to say, I am the Lord's servant. Are you glad? How many people a thousand years, 2,000 years from now are going to say, I'm glad that that person that was there on a Sunday morning that walked accidentally into a movie theater thinking they were going to see Star Wars, but actually ended up in a crazy church, believed that God could do something with their life and just responded in faith and said, I'm the Lord's servant. And what could come out of your life? <clears throat> That's what God is looking for. It's the X factor. That's the it factor. It's not how good you are, how bold you are, how confident you are. It's not about that. It's about, do you have the faith to respond and say, I'm the Lord's servant? Number two, you got to find people that will encourage your faith. This is big. Mary is confused and disturbed. She responds correctly. She says, yes, Lord. But then she goes to Elizabeth and she's there for about three months. And Elizabeth, it's not an accident that she goes there. Elizabeth has a miracle baby growing inside of her. And so Mary goes and says, look, God did it for you. He could do it for me. They get together. And what does Elizabeth do? She strengthens Mary's faith. She encourages her heart. She believes in her. She gets around her. You got to surround yourself with people. You got to find people in your life that are not going to speak a no to you and your destiny and, and, the, and the, the, the word of faith that God's put in you. But you got to find people that are going to come around you and say yes and amen. Yes, you can do it. Yes, you can. Yes, people are going to say stuff about you, but this is what, what God wants to do through your life. Come on. The only reason this church exists is because people got in my, that I have in my corner got behind me and said, people will say things, people will accuse you, whatever, but you got to step forward in faith. You got to be who God's called you to be. That's why this church exists, because I had people that encouraged my faith and not my fear. And you got to get people in your life that are going to come around you and say, you can do it. Not because you're great. You're not. But God is great. God is good. He's got a plan for you. Come on, I'm preaching good today. Man, I must have had some coffee this morning. All right. Shanda. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Mary goes to Elizabeth. She encourages her. She builds her up. She believes in her. Do you have people in your life like this? Do you have safe people? Do you have people that you can just flat out ugly cry in front of? You know what I mean? It's like, you sound like a dying walrus, you know? You got to have people in your life that you can just get around and you can say, this is what I'm going through. This is where I'm at. People that are the 3 a.m. friends. You know what I mean about 3 a.m. friends? It's 3 a.m. Why are you calling me? I need you. <laughs> you know, it's an whole ugly cry thing. People that are there for you, that are in your corner, that are, at your, that are there for you. Listen, this is a shameless plug, but if you're not part of a joy group, where are you going to build these kind of friendships and faith encouraging places? Get into a joy group. Don't, don't be trying to go solo. That's lame as a Christian. It doesn't make you a better Christian. It makes you a worse Christian. Get in a group. Get, get around people that encourage your faith. Number three, be willing to take the step of faith. Mary responds correctly. She says, yes, Lord, I'm your servant. She goes and she gets encouraged. She goes and she gets built up. She has those, th this person, Elizabeth, that's speaking faith, not fear. But it says in verse 56, Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then went back to her own home. She goes back to Nazareth, back to Podunkville, back to ridicule, back to the pain, back to the process. Come on, back to the place where faith is going to be lived out. See, she's not going to have the baby with Elizabeth and come back and be like, I don't know where this baby came from. See, for God's purposes to come into fruition in her life, she has to go back to the place of pain and face the fire, 
face the ridicule, face it all. She's, she's in this place that's safe. I mean, imagine she would have wanted to stay with her cousin who believes in her, who's with her, but she has to go back to Nazareth to fulfill her destiny. At some point in your life, there's these moments where, yeah, you're with your group, you're with the people that encourage your faith, but then there comes a time when you got to step out of the boat and you got to walk. There comes a time when you got to step out in the, and take that step of faith and be who God's called you to be and take a risk and not just play it safe. There comes a time when you have to step out and say, I'm going to do what God's called me to do, no matter if anybody else thinks I can or anybody else thinks that I will, even me. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to walk out. I'm going to step out. Come on, you got to take that step of faith. I love it because we're in Eugene and we have the University of Oregon, which is Nike University. And what's Nike's slogan? Just do it. And I think that they got that from, from Jesus because that's a Jesus thing. That's not a shoe thing. That's a God thing. Come on. They have nice shoes. That's not, that's not no two bits about it. But, but come on, that's a God thing. Just do it. That God wants to put that word of faith in you, get people around you that will encourage you. But at some point you have to just do it. You got to step out. Listen, I believe even today the Lord is encouraging you, putting some, some faith in your life, putting some faith in your heart. There's something that God has spoken to you, maybe that you are confused by, maybe that you are disturbed by, maybe that you, you, you get nervous when you think about it, but the Lord is calling you to take a step of faith and it's time to just do it, to step out, to step out. Because think about what happens in this story. I know I made jokes about opening presents and that being what Christmas is about, but it's really not. What Christmas is really about is the invasion of heaven into this planet that God looked and said, I won't leave the people that I desperately love in their sin and in death and in despair, but I will come even in the most weak and powerless apparently way and show up and invade this planet because that was the moment when absolutely every demon in hell was trembling in their boots because God had showed up on this planet. Come on, somebody unlikely, so unlikely in the unlikeliest of ways, but here's what it led to, that that little baby that was born in a manger in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago would grow into a man who would give his life and die on a cross and absolutely pull the pants down on every demon of hell, give it a spanking and kick it down its way and say, I'm here to take back what's mine. Come on, that's better preaching than you're giving me credit for. Jesus would absolutely humiliate and destroy the, the powers of darkness and set people free. And that's what he came to do. But it wouldn't have happened unless somebody said, I'm unlikely. I'm just a little girl. I'm, I'm going to face ridicule, but I'm going to believe that my God is good enough. My God is great enough to take me in my weakness and use an unlikely person in an unlikely place in an unlikely way to achieve an unlikely purpose.